Well, welcome to the Navigator's Bible class. We are currently studying the book of Revelation. And in these last times, with all the trouble we see, we must remember that God is good. All the time. All the time. And He cares for us. And uh, nothing slips by Him. And uh, we are in His hand. Will never fall out of his hand, and he knows uh, what is best and good for us. He's working in our lives. So last week we were in um, chapter 15. Chapter 15 of Revelation is basically an introduction to the seven vials that contain the seven last plagues. Uh, we also got into the fact that these seven last plagues, the seven vials, are poured out on the earth after the completion of the first resurrection. This would be the completion of the first resurrection. So the seven vials would be poured out here. I don't have them written on the chart because it's such a little space there for us. Um, also, this being the completion of the first resurrection, this is mentioned in Revelation 20. It said, blessed are those who uh, are in the first resurrection. Now, the first resurrection, I do want to repeat this, is a three-part event. The first part was of the first resurrection was Jesus Christ's resurrection. He was the first fruits of the resurrection. It says that in, in 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, that would correspond to the first fruits of the harvest. See? And then we have the rapture of the church. That would be the group that we are in. 1 Thessalonians 4. That would be the main harvest the second part of the first resurrection. The third part of the first resurrection could be called the gleanings. The gleanings. That, uh, the, what is, is left is taken out. So after this is complete, then God will pour out His wrath on this earth. Note that these vials affect only those that worship the beast and take His mark. Because those who are saved, those who uh, are His, are out. And all this judgment falls on the wicked only. Most important thing to remember, God reserves wrath for His enemies. Not His friends, not His family, not His bride, not those He loves. Okay, in chapter 16, we're still reviewing... We talked about the first vial last week. In uh, verse 2 it says, uh, The first went and poured his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped his image. This noisome and grievous sore is uh, basically the same thing as the malignant uh, disease of leprosy. And we see that in the Bible a lot, talking about leprosy. This plague, as it gets toward the second coming, right at the end, this plague accelerates and it eventually consumes them. Zechariah 14, verse 12. We read that last week. Uh, and then we talked about getting rid of this leprous plague. Because what happens is when someone takes the mark uh, back over in this, in this time in here, they may have taken the mark without knowing what it was for, other than just somebody sent you a credit card type thing. They needed it to buy and sell. Later, uh, they see that there's, they have to worship the beast, and through the preaching of the 144,000 and the two witnesses in Jerusalem, they discover that they are 
really in trouble because they've taken the mark, but they don't haven't worshipped the beast. So how do they get rid of this mark, which is developing into a uh, a disease? And we find this in Second Peter or First Peter three twenty one. That is a what you would say is a problem passage, if you've heard that term, a problem passage. It's not if you read it word for word. There are three baptisms that you see in that verse. Obviously, the first is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that spiritual cleansing that happens when we are saved. The Holy Spirit comes in, you see. And that is called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You find that in Romans chapter 6. Uh, the second baptism is one that we have, uh, most of us, I would say, have been baptized. Uh, after we're saved, we want to get baptized. The pastor, you're up in the baptistry, and the pastor says, have you accepted Christ as your Savior? You know, this type of thing. And then you are baptized as a public testimony to others that you have believed. So what happens is that today, when we are baptized, the physical baptism in water is a figure of the baptism of the Spirit. In other words, we publicly testify that we are believers and that we have been baptized by the Holy Spirit. Uh, when we were saved, that happened. So today, this is a figure of that which does save us. It's the baptism of the Holy Spirit that saves us. He comes into us. He makes us alive when we were formerly dead. It says, you hath he quickened, made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sin. That's what the Holy Spirit does when He comes in. He makes us alive, see. So when we are uh, publicly baptized with water, it is a testimony or a figure of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. However, it mentions in this verse that it also will later be for removing the filth of the flesh. The filth of the flesh is another word for the leprosy that begins to spread. The filth of the flesh contaminates the clothes, contaminates the environment where the individual is, and, uh, and this public baptism during this time here, the Old Testament type of this was Naaman. You remember Naaman, the Syrian, uh, what was he, a general captain or something? And he had leprosy, and Elisha told him to go dip himself seven times in the Jordan River, and he would be cleansed. And he did that, and he was cleansed of leprosy, a miracle. And I believe that will happen here, because baptism then at this time... <clears throat> Physical water baptism will cleanse one from that leprosy from the mark. And it is a public testimony of their belief in Christ, which will probably result in their martyrdom during this time. Many are killed. Uh, this is just my belief on that. Uh, just looking at the verse... That seems to be what is taught in the verse. I'm sure that there are others that might not come to that conclusion. So let me mention that this is one of, one of my ideas that I, I believe about this verse. Anybody that studies Revelation, teaches it, or any part of the Bible for that matter, is going to... Uh, present to you a snapshot of their own ideas at the time. And later, their ideas may be a little different. 
I know I have changed my mind about several things in my Bible study that I previously had thought God was teaching. I hope that I always mention to you that this is my idea and it's just not stamped and by the by the Holy Spirit and chiseled in stone, but that it might be just my idea. We'll come across another one of those today that previously in this class I thought was a little different, but after deeper study into it, uh, I believe I've got some different ideas. So that's not, I hope, being wishy-washy, I hope that is you know, growing in our our study as we go. Yes, ma'am. Quick question. Um, when you said that in the last three and a half years of the tribulation, that this will cleanse people of the mark, or is it the plague? I believe the, or the leprosy. both. I believe that the mark eventually uh, goes uh, causes this leprosy. Uh, the plague that God gives them okay. and uh, to get rid of the mark and that uh, I believe public baptism acknowledging their belief in Christ will do that it's just my thoughts right. okay you mentioned about the worship plus receiving worship from yeah the two, plus. two things will yeah. doom a man during this time taking the mark and worshiping the beast these who do this public testimony about their belief in Christ will not have worshipped the beast because if they worship the beast after they've taken the mark and worshiped the beast those are the two things that will doom the man you see that in verse 2 that we just read um, about those that receive the mark and worship the beast okay we get into the second vial again yes ma'am are all these vials going to be dropped at the same time? No, I think they're one right after another, but they are all compact in a very short time. And we'll see why we believe that is so. The second vial is this. Look at verse 3. And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as the blood of a dead man. I mean, not just blood, but blood of a dead man. That's, that's even worse. Huh? And every living soul died in the sea. Now, if you look at the second trumpet, back in, what is it, chapter 8, the second trumpet said uh, a third of the sea was affected and became blood. In this vial, it says the entire earth sea is affected. See? In the trumpet, only a third of the people that were in it died. But this one, if you're on the water, if you're in a boat, at this time, it will kill. Yes? To blend to this, and that same note on the uh, water, if these people are to get baptized in water, you have to understand that there is very little water to be baptized in. Yeah, right. Well, now keep in mind this happens after those who are believers are taken out. So it's beyond their time to accept Christ. This is now God pouring out his judgment on them for rejecting him. This is not a God saying, okay, here's your second chance. He said, this is the result of your decision. Okay, yes ma'am. Is this after the uh, Satan is thrown into the lake of fire? Or is no, this before? No, this is before. Satan, before he's still Satan around. Satan is not bound until here. Okay, so all these people and the blood and everything, Satan's still around with his yes. people? Okay. Yes. Okay, did everybody hear that? Was Satan still around this time? Yes, he is. Okay, Earth's oceans are turned to blood. This is similar, like I said, to the second trumpet, but this affects the entire world. Uh, it's as if that trumpet, the second trumpet, was a warning, see, that this is coming. The trumpet may have, the second trumpet happened probably in here somewhere, 
but this second vial is right in here. So the second trumpet was a harbinger of this. See? Okay. It says a very interesting thing. Every living soul there dies. Uh, even, even the animals that are there, they're gone. Think of all the sea creatures. Boom, they're dead. Uh, how many of you have ever heard that man has a soul, but animals don't have souls? You've heard that. Okay. How many say that animals don't have a spirit, but man has a spirit? You've heard that. This verse here, a little pointer out. I want to use this because I'm putting new batteries in it. <laughs> this verse here, if you read that, you see animals have souls. If you read this verse here, you see that animals have spirits. Hello? Not like ours, keep in mind. But they do have souls and spirits. Read the verses. I, that, that was just something I threw out to be funny. <laughs> oh, it's funny. I have a question on the, the sea um, turns to blood like of a dead man. Uh -huh. Blood in a dead man is congealed. So, is, you know, it's not flowing. Is the sea going to be solid? It may, and that may be it. I guess it's, it's certainly not going to be pleasant. I think that's the whole thing that... Uh, it will coagulate and not be pleasant. Okay. All ships in the affected areas are destroyed. Not like chapter 8, verse 9 uh, of the trumpet. This time, all the areas are affected. We mentioned that. We get into the third vial here, which is very interesting. Verse 4. And the third angel poured out his vial from the rivers and the fountains of waters, and they became blood. Now, these are the fresh water. I heard the angel of the waters say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art, wast, and shall be, because thou hast judged thus. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. I heard another of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. Uh, horrible thing here. This one is the earth's fresh water. It's turned to blood. From now on until Christ comes back, there is no drinking water. That's why we believe that this is like the last day or the last day couple of days at the most see it's really really imminent the return of the Lord or imagine turning on your uh, nothing to drink <coughs> nothing to drink yes I had a Christian uh, chemistry professor in college he came out with a beaker about the size of a plane half full of finely ground gold. And that's called the colloid, the way you do gold. You remember when the golden half was ground up? Right. They poured it in one, the river. And what did the river do? Burn the blood. Burn the blood. He takes this beaker and pours it into another beaker of distilled water and it turns blood red. Mm. It's Mind that, that would have been a very interesting demonstration to see. Okay. No fresh water to drink. This situation will be corrected by Christ when he comes back shortly. Uh, in Zechariah uh, chapter 14, verse 8, it says this. And it shall be in that day, that's the, that day when Christ comes back, that living waters shall go out from Jerusalem, half of them toward the former sea, half of them toward the hinder sea, and in summer and winter it shall be. So Jesus heals.
the waters. And as it flows out of Jerusalem, it begins to cleanse the earth's water. Okay. So he remedies this at his coming. Also, John 4. I got, I got to bring that in. John 4 was the woman at the well. Remember? And Jesus said, if you'd have asked of me, I would have given you living water. Okay. And so he is the water of life. So when he comes back, he will remedy this situation. <clears throat> Note verse 6. This is after the last martyr is killed. Note the past tense in this verse. Verse 6. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets. See, the martyrdom has come to an end. All the saved people are now gone. And there is no one left for them to kill. No believers left. So when it says, Thou, for they have shed the blood of the saints, we know that, that that was past. That was when the saints' blood was shed over here. So now it's looking back uh, into the martyrdom as past tense. So we know that this third vial happens after their martyrdoms are done. Uh, I... It says in verse 6, they are worthy of this plague. They are worthy of this plague. And God gave them blood to drink. Again, that's kind of like the illustration of the, of the elements of the golden calf. They worship the golden calf. Moses grinds that thing up into powder and makes them drink it. Why? Because they earned it. Here, God gives them blood to drink, for they are worthy. Scary thing. Scary thing. Okay, let's look at the fourth vial. We're moving right along here. Uh, the fourth vial in verses 8 and 9. The fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with with fire and men were scorched with great heat and they got right with God didn't they <laughs> no no and they blasphemed the name of God which had the power of these plagues and they repented not to give him glory and this is man gritting his teeth against God even though he's in great pain, the hatred and the bitterness toward God has been so brought out in them that that's what they're doing. Um, the sun's heat greatly increased. Uh, Isaiah 30, let me, let me read you this in Isaiah 30, verse 25 and 26. There shall be upon every high mound, upon every high hill, rivers and streams and waters, in the day of the great slaughter, when the towers fall. Moreover, the light of the moon shall be as the light of the sun, and the light of the sun shall be sevenfold, as the light of seven days. That's the description of what happens here. Uh, this Daniel, <laughs> I could help but think, I put it up there. But you remember when Nebuchadnezzar built his, uh, had his fiery furnace going, and he was mad at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego because they would not worship? He said, make that furnace seven times hotter than it is accustomed to be, and then throw these guys into it. And the men that threw the, them in were slain by the heat of the thing. And yet it did not affect Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, nor their clothes. And when Nebuchadnezzar looked in, who was with them? Jesus. The Son of God. Okay. 
so uh, uh, I thought that was an interesting thing about the seven times. But men are scorched. They can't even go outside without being second, third degree burns happening to them. They can't drink. They can't go outside. And they just get madder and madder at God. They blasphemed God even more and repented not. Luke the fifth body, verses 10 and 11. And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain. And they got right this time, didn't they? Nope. No. It says they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and repented not of their deeds. Yes, sir. One verse says uh, about knowing your tongue is if uh, you're doing your research and think about people that can't, that don't have water. Uh, one of the end, end results of that is their tongue starts swelling up and they start chewing on them. And, that's, uh, and that didn't make them feel better. <laughs> no. I, I did not know that, but that's a good thing. No, the sun's light is extinguished. Uh, sun has alpha rays, beta rays, gamma rays, and I forget which one is light and which one is heat. But the light ray is turned off. The heat ray is not turned off. And darkness comes over the kingdom of the beast, begins where he is, and spreads. This will cause an increase in the pain and it will not end the extreme heat from the fourth vial. <clears throat> so they still have the hot, but they don't have the light. They're in darkness. This is a prelude to the lake of fire, by the way. Have you ever heard some people say, well, I'll see you in hell? That's the stupidest thing somebody could say. Because in hell they will be in outer darkness. They will not be able to see a thing. Okay. Again, more blasphemy and no repentance. Blasphemy, no repentance. Uh, we see the sixth vial in verse 12. This is an interesting one. The sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates and the water thereof was dried up that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. Know where the Euphrates River is. The kings of the east are to the east of that. Jerusalem and Israel is to the west of that. And this Euphrates River is dried up, uh, opening the way for the kings of the east. And we're going to look and see if we can identify this. Uh, there are two ideas that exist about this uh, particular event. Some tie it into... Um, the sixth um, trumpet, which is in chapter 9, verse 13, where it talks this angel uh, loosens, loosens four angels from the river Euphrates, and then there's this 200 horsemen army that comes out of there and they go around killing many, many, many people. And some have identified this army as being the kings of the east in the sixth mile. Uh, matter of fact, we mentioned that that was a possibility earlier. 
that this was a demonic army from hell that sings the trumpet. Problem with this is in Revelation 9 verses 14 and 15 says that these 200 uh, from the sixth trumpet will be active for a year, a month, a day, and an hour. Do you see the do you see the conflict here? There's no way that this would last that long in there. So we have two different events. The other possibility is this is indeed a great army from the east gathering together with the other armies to fight against Jerusalem and against Christ. We'll see that uh, mentioned later, yes. Now I'm all confused because I thought the third mile drive called the river. No, it, turned the, it turned the rivers to blood. And all the fresh water was. So this one dries up the blood. The, the river here, this is the Euphrates River, is dried up. So there's an ar this, this opens a way for the armies. Of the, you think there's a lot of people over there in the east? <laughs> there's a lot of people over there. We don't know how many are over there. They won't tell us how many. But it obviously, this is preparing the way so that they too can gather with the armies of the world. The only time this world will be united is when they're united against Christ when he comes back. Alright? We have, at this point, a parenthetical comment in verses 13 to 16. We have looked at this before, so we won't spend a lot of time on it. Let's read these uh, four verses. Uh, this is mentioned between the sixth trumpet, uh, the sixth vial, and the seventh vial. Verse 13, and I saw, this is John speaking, of course, Three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, that's Satan, out of the mouth of the beast, that's the Antichrist, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth into the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Verse 15. Christ says, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Verse 16. And he, speaking of Christ, gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. The kings of the east will join all the other armies. They will meet in Armageddon, which is the plain of Megiddo, and they will march on Jerusalem and on, at Christ as he comes back. Now notice, the, sat the satanic trinity is mentioned here. The dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. Countering God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. That's a counterfeit. Uh, we've already talked about them before. It says here that these are uh, uh, frogs that come out of their mouths, are demons that will have worked miracles to deceive men all during this last seven years. Remember, Christ said one the one thing that is characteristic of this seven year period is deception. Deception. People will see something and they'll be deceived by it. 
Also, these demons motivate men to march against Jerusalem and against Christ. But, they are carrying out, unbeknownst to them, God's plan. Because here it mentions Christ saying he gathered them together in a place called Armageddon. So God is bringing them together and he's using these uh, deceiving demons to motivate people to do this. They gather together at Armageddon. That has such a negative term, doesn't it? You hear that term, Armageddon. It's, it's something that it catches your attention because it's, I don't know, it's just, you know, people, people just, when they hear that, they, they're, they're, oh my, oh my, and they react in such a way. Well, they should. They should because it is coming. Suppose that before we go to bed tonight, this event here happens. We are taken out of here. It would be about seven more years, maybe just a few months longer for that Armageddon gathering to take place. See how close we are to this? It is literally around the corner. What should that motivate us to do? Number one, 1 Thessalonians 4, is comfort one another with the fact that our, our loved ones have gone to be with Him. Second of all, is to comfort ourselves knowing that Christ will come and take us out of here before this stuff happens. Uh, now is the accepted time. Now is today is the day of salvation. It is not worth putting off. Someone you know does not know the Lord. Just try to lay it on their hearts. Witness to them. Tell them of the urgency that they get right with the Lord. That they believe in Him. Um, the seventh vial takes place, verse 17 through 21. Now the seventh vial, the seventh trumpet, the seventh seal, that's all the return of the Lord. It's also the third woe, because if you uh, remember back the fifth trumpet was the first woe, and the sixth trumpet was the second woe, and John says, a third one is coming right behind it, and the third one was the return of Christ. That is it. Look at verse 17. The seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, it is done. There were voices, thunders, lightnings, great earthquake, such as not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake. That's interesting. Not since men were upon the earth. Did you know there was a great earthquake to happen before man was even created? <laughs> Read Joel chapter 4. Anyway, verse 19, the great city divided in three parts of cities of the nations fell that great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give her the cup of the wine and the fierceness of his wrath. Every island fled away, mountains were not found, they fell upon men a great hail of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent, and men did what? They blasphemed God because of the plague of hell, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. All this happens as Jesus comes back. These are the events at the return of Christ. This comes along with the seventh seal and the seventh trumpet. 
It also mentions the destruction of Babylon. We'll get into starting next week. This all happens just before Christ returns. There will be great geological shaking. Now, notice verse 17 says, It is done. Who said something very similar to that? Jesus. When did he say that? It what did he say? It is finished. It is finished. He said, it is finished. Guess what? It is finished again. Let's see what's finished this time. I, that's, that's a powerful thing. It is accomplished. It is completed. It's a done thing. It has happened. The first coming, the price of sin of the world was paid completely by Christ. The Father is satisfied that he completely paid for the sins of the world. And not just yours and mine. John says in 1 John 2, 2, not for ours only, but for the sins of the entire world. They're paid for. Jesus said, it is finished, and it was finished. This time, the second coming, the wrath of the Father on this world is completely satisfied. So when Jesus says it is done, it is finished, it means that all the wrath of God that's abiding on these unbelievers and unbelievers of all time has now been satisfied. And we will hear no more of God's Man. Because here it is done. It Praise is done. God. Yep. And, and they are the ones that give the wrath. Right there. Okay. It's like the seventh trumpet. The seventh trumpet we saw in 1115. There was a great earthquake. That was the second wall. The third wall was actually the return to Christ the earth to conquer it. You'll see that described in detail in chapter 19, verses 11 through 21. The details of Christ's return. So the seventh seal, the seventh trumpet, the seventh vial, and the third woe is all the return of Christ. Why is it a woe? Because it's a woe to man. He is no longer in control ever again. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Yes. Next week we're going to be in chapter 17 and 18. We won't take all of it, but it'll be the destruction of Babylon. It's important because in this final book in the Bible, God spends two chapters on it. So it's important. Yes, sir. Between the drying up, or I should say the turning of blood on the water, and Armageddon, when the armies march, will the armies be filling their canteens or their water bottles? And how would they do it? Unless they wouldn't. The, unless the water's turned back. They're not. This is such a short time that they're coming over dry as a bone. There's nothing to drink. Can you imagine trying to fight when you have no water? They don't stand a chance. I was just saying, you know, John the Baptist said, you know, repent, repent, repent. You know, and we should be like John the Baptist saying, repent, repent. Because this is, this is even a more dire situation. Yes. Is, is this going to, I, I understand your picture of what you're doing, but is the world still going to carry on? I mean, are people going to be over here complaining about the president and are they going to still be complaining about things or are they going to be focused on? <laughs> well, one thing is that this, notice, the nation's cities fall. This is a worldwide thing. 
There, it's going to be worldwide destruction with the earthquake, islands are moved, mountains are moved. The infrastructure of the entire world is going to crumble, literally. Okay? Christ will rebuild. Okay, let's go. Heavenly Father, thank you for our time together. Help this study to motivate us to live for you. Help this study to motivate us to tell others about you. We pray, Lord, that you would bless in the service following now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.